Path of Night is an actual play Vampire the Masquerade podcast set in the classic world of darkness. We're all friends. We're here to have fun, but our story can include graphic violence, drug use, sexual content, and other mature themes. We've talked at our table about safety, comfort, and consent, both as players and storytellers. We know what to expect. We're all excited to be here, and we want you to feel the same. So listener discretion is advised. Now, let's walk the Path of Night. Johnny, we pick up with you alone, having spent some time back behind the Sherwood Cafe where your haven is. The quarry hasn't really talked to each other in a few nights, and everyone seems to be slowly deciding what or how they feel about what's taken place back at the Elysium. You were part of the crew that was assigned to clean up after everything was said and done, which means it was left to you to handle the body of the lupine that went berserk on the kindred that were gathered. So you wake up around when you normally do every night with the same routine on the little small windowless cement block haven room that you have long forgotten and interconnected with tunnels that lead around the neighborhood. You turn on that one light, get a good look at your music collection, one of the few only things that you own, and then you see her wrapped tight in a blue tarp Small, possibly small, compared to how you remembered her when you were fighting her to the death. What do you do? Johnny takes a few minutes sitting up on his... I imagine that he probably probably sleeps on a cot. Foregoed getting the traditional kind of cliche coffin just as a cot in the cement room down underneath the the block where the Sherwood is. It's probably an old uh, fallout shelter that got built into the foundation back in 40s, 50s, who knows. New Haven is infamous for whole sections of the city buried underneath the new, so fallout shelters like that, very common. Without looking, he reaches over to a bedside table and grabs up a pack of cigarettes, looks down and kind of frowns to notice that there's none left, tosses the empty pack back on the, on the bedside table and looks over at the, the concrete wall opposite where the... Uh, the girl's wrapped up and kind of looks at the remains of where he ended up smashing the wall. In the moment, he was a flurry of all kinds of emotions, dealing with his daughter and frenzying from hunger and fighting Shaw and protecting his pack, that he didn't really get a chance to deal with the fact that the, the lupine was a young girl. It's about then that it hits you, that you call them your pack. Yeah. He doesn't even exhale or swallow. He thinks about that and then kind of just tongues the fangs in his mouth. Thinks back to a time when he was being forcibly inducted into a sect that he does not want to be his home. And he kind of just drops his hand, his head into his hands and rubs his temples because all of that is now catch, finally catching up with him. Thinks a lot about all of the other shovel heads that he were told were now his brothers and sisters. And he thinks about the city gangrel who acted like dogs that he was raised up with. And he starts thinking about the man that was Johnny's sire, an individual that he never got his name, but a dangerous individual with a crescent moon tattooed on his hand. And... Before he can really deal with the emotions, he kind of just tousles up his hair, slaps his head a few times, and is like, all right, sex, and just get up. You got work to do. Stands on his feet and will make sure that she is wrapped up properly, that he can possibly get her up to the truck, which I don't think he, he's probably, he's probably already lost the truck from the Elysium that we got out in. Now he's probably got some other vehicle that he's doing some work in that that Weathers hooked him up with, or maybe Miles hooked him up with. Either way, he's got to get her body up to there and make sure that 
nobody sees exactly what he's doing. It doesn't take much work. There's some paths that are already laid out that really aren't trafficked by the kind. You make your way to what looks like a very kind of plasticky looking Nissan Xterra. It's like, like that forest green color and it's kind of meant to look like it's for off-roading, but you know this thing is not meant for that. Miles. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty though. You open up the back seat and kind of gingerly lay this, this young woman down. When you shut the back door, you can kind of hear the, the squelching sound of silt being displaced by, like, boot heels. And you realize you're not alone in the alley. Johnny tenses up but doesn't, like, swing around to look who it is. Uh, hey, Johnny. You hear the familiar voice of a man by the name of Phil McTavish, the owner of the uh, bar that your haven is connected to. Uh, Johnny, is everything all right? He relaxes a little bit turns around and kind of pastes a, a fake smile. Hey, Phil. How's it going? Uh, well, as usual, the circumstances aren't exactly perfect, but I, I can use your help for the situation that I'm dealing with. Uh, Phil, I don't know if tonight's a good night. I, uh, Johnny, there's no, there's no good nights for this. Uh, can I talk to you just a moment? Johnny kind of looks into the vehicle where there is a girl's body tarped up in the back seat, tenses up... <laughs> All right. Locks the vehicle. All right, Phil, what do you, what do you got? Phil kind of says, resting his hands on his hips. He's wearing, like, a green and blue flannel shirt that's kind of buttoned up probably more than it should be. He's, he's a bit overweight, over 40, balding. His jeans are, you know, like really, really, really blue. But he looks, uh, there's this fear in his eyes when he looks at you. Johnny, uh, I have a, I have a, a, a bartender who's been uh, putting in some work, and she's she's going through a little bit of trouble. Uh, she's not quite talking to me, and I've got this bad feeling. She keeps showing up nervous. She's ducking out at odd times. There's something going on. I think she's in trouble. You think she's in trouble? Trying to have a pretty good instinct about these things. Phil, if, if this was just some shitty boyfriend, I feel like you wouldn't be coming to me. What the hell is going on here? Let's just say she's real scared. And I feel like, I don't know, there's something different about this. Johnny's gaze kind of softens a bit. He looks at Phil and recognizes that the two of them are probably not that different. Johnny just got cased in amber ten years back. If, he, if that hadn't happened, it, maybe his hair would be thinning like Phil's. Maybe his gut would have come out a little bit more. But they're both wearing the same kind of flannel. They're both wearing a beat-up pair of jeans and pair of boots, and he can't help but feel like he's got to look out for this guy. He nods. All right, what's, uh, what's her address? She lives out in the tray. Johnny immediately recognizes that as a place that is like where a good 80% of like violent crimes happen in New Haven. It is a very, very bad neighborhood. You know, he takes out a cigarette... Lights one up, kind of offers as like almost like a, an apology for his, disturbing you. Or... His eyebrow definitely kind of like raises when he sees the pack come out and he kind of angles over a little bit. And... Yeah, here and here, please. Thanks. Um, Tonight I'm out. Of course. That's how you know it's going to be a bad night, huh? For sure. Her name's Sheila. She's actually inside right now. She arrived about a half hour ago and uh, late. She is jumping at her own shadow. Something is going on. All right. Johnny reaches out, grabs his lighter, lights the uh, the cigarette, takes a long drag, looks at the uh, the lighter, pockets it, reaches out and grabs the pack of cigarettes out of Phil's pocket. These will kill you, you know. Puts it in his own. Oh, pocket. you dick! <laughs>, Laughs. Nah, that's fair. I need you living a long time, Phil. I don't know if that's in the guards for either of us. Johnny kind of half-heartedly smirks at that, pats him on the shoulder, and heads inside to go talk to Sheila. Uh, when you head inside, it is bustling with activity. You can kind of hear all of the classic sounds. Drinks, so drink. Bus bustling for the Sherwood is like, what, six people? No, it's actually, uh, it's actually legitimately oh, all right. bustling uh, with activity right now. Um, what night is tonight? But it's not is it tonight a Friday or 
you're not really sure. Yeah. <laughs> that that kind of I think I think the concept of of Friday Saturday so that's all kind of outside of Johnny's capacity to re- keep in mind. Yeah. So but the crowd that's there largely looks like it's from one crew of people. Mm. You know that like that's kind of crowd where everyone seems to know each other. Someone's got a birthday or something. Yeah. And or somebody's back in town or no. Yeah. And a lot of these these guys are a little on the young side, loud and excitable, uh, all kind of getting together and getting absolutely hammered over their winter vacation. Where's Johnny's blood pool at currently? Uh, roll me a d10. Oh, boy. Oh, 10. In that case, uh, Johnny is going to spend a point of his uh, blood mm-hmm. to swell up a little bit just so that nobody wants to mess with him. Just so I look a little bit extra dangerous as I kind of walk mm-hmm. over to the bar. As you approach the bar, there's uh, a handful of these uh, young, excitable men who are rather overtly complimenting Sheila on her appearance. They're ordering rounds of shots, and she seems to be kind of playing it safe and staying pretty well behind the bar and out of arm's reach kind of subtly indicating that, you know, someone already made a grab at her. Mm. Uh, She herself is, you know, she's a good-looking young girl, uh, healthy. uh, She's dressed in kind of a a tight black shirt that's kind of like a little, a bit of cleavage showing. But, you know, she's bartending, so she's wearing kind of like a tight skirt. Her hair is kind of that long, like, raven color that's so popular. She's got total, like, raccoon eyes for makeup. She kind of gives you this, like, nervous look as you apply, as, as you approach, as though uh, your intimidation factor is not just applying to these, like, goons, but to her as well. And they part away, admittedly begrudgingly, as, as you approach. Johnny takes off his leather jacket puts it on the seat adjacent, and mm-hmm. then sits down at one of the seats of the bar. Okay. And that way he's taken up double Some the space. Some space, yeah. Yeah. He kind of mean mugs some of the other guys for a while just so they know to give him a little bit extra space. Some of the guys, uh, they've got, like, red New York Yankees baseball caps and, like, big, heavy, thick coats. They're wearing bright-colored sneakers. They've got their haircuts, like like kind of like buzz cuts. Oh, Some the, of them they blonde. The strap too, they right? got soul patches and chin straps. Ooh. So they definitely kind of like mean mug that you back, but they like also hold each other back to like protect you from their incredible capacity for violence. Eventually, Sheila leans on the bar and she's like, "Hey, what are you drinking?" Oh. Johnny kind of takes a look over at the bar, tr- trying to remember things that he used to drink once upon a time. Uh, how about a, uh, how about a Manhattan? Make one of those? Yeah, you can have a Manhattan. Yeah, he nods and so what's your name? Waits, waits patiently for her to... She um, starts fixing you a drink. Name's Johnny. Uh, she kind of pauses at that. You must be uh, the new girl, Sheila. Phil told me a little about you. Oh. Uh, well, I don't think Phil sends me anywhere, but he uh, he definitely let me know what was going on, and well, I just got a big heart. Let's say he uh, takes a ashtray, moves it closer to him, and ashes in there a little bit. She slides you your drink, uh, and actually lights up herself, kind of sharing an ashtray with you. And Johnny uh, just tips the rocks glass and kind of just looks in it, but doesn't ever leave the table. Yeah. <sighs> Phil likes to get in other people's business, is what I'm gathering from this. Well, he's a good soul. Anytime he's gotten anybody else's business, it probably needed to happen. But he also knows when to leave things be, and when it is serious enough that he does have to do that. Why? Is, that, uh, is he getting into someone's business he shouldn't be doing? It's like she gives you two looks at once. One sheepish and clearly feeling a little called out by what you're inferring. The other look is kind of a, a resolved expression, like like she can take care of herself and and maybe, you know, if she handles this her way, this problem might go away. She says so many things to you all at once with just a look. She bats her, like, big blue eyes at you and sort of grumbles. 
when she bats eyes at Johnny, he actually kind of like gets a little bit darker in the expression. Like, don't pull bullshit with me, girl. Oh, she pauses at that. Uh, you know what? Fine. I'll talk to you, but afterwards, I want to be left alone. You don't need to be running errands for Phil, and I don't need anyone running errands for Phil. Not with regard to my life. You know, I do a lot of work in this city. I move a lot of things. I talk to a lot of people. But one thing I don't abide by is anyone calling me a fucking errand boy. So you tell me what's going on. Do not lie to me. And we'll have a good night. Her uh, bristling at the idea of you helping her kind of withers. Uh, I need a cigarette. Do you want to talk up, eh? Sure. She puts out the cigarette that she just lit. Calls to her friend Tammy. This this woman with like blonde hair and blue eyes that kind of comes over. And uh, Tammy takes over. And she kind of cuts through the back. And just seems to kind of assume Phil approves of you being able to follow her right along the path she's taking. You head out back with Sheila and the two of you find yourselves beside these like old rust covered dumpsters. She lights up this menthol smelling Newport cigarette. She gives you a look like maybe Phil's right about something. Because you can you can recognize the fear in her eyes, and it's the fear of someone who has brushed with some of the dark secrets of the world that kind of changed someone forever. Johnny uh, never stopped smoking the cigarette he was smoking inside the bar, heads out, leans on the dumpster next to her, and then uses a, a maneuver that he's practiced a long time in his work as a bully, bully boy, which is... Now is the time to kind of switch from bad cop to good cop. So he's his vision kind of crystallizes with awe. Tell me what's going on. She takes a, a nervous breath and kind of again stares at you with these haunted eyes. I was seeing someone named Eddie. And Eddie was involved in some sort of uh, trafficking, you know, from from Bridgeport to New York on the ferry. And long story short, he got mixed up with some people and uh, he ran. Um, during the course of his running, uh, he, was, he was in New York. He took, uh, he took the subway to get away uh, and he saw something. He saw something? Yeah. And whatever it was, I don't know. He says... He says that he doesn't think it was human, and it bit him, it scratched him, something happened. But by the time he got home, he was bleeding, and and he got really sick. The other night, uh, actually, like, uh, right after my interview here, um, he took off from home with this, this look in his eyes, like he was, he was insane. And, you know, no one can find him, no one's heard from him. But every now and again, when I'm walking, you know, home or or out running errands, I swear to God, Johnny, I see him. And I think he's following me. I want you to think long and hard about this next question I'm going to ask you. Okay. What do you want? I, I think Eddie has some sort of, like, rabies or something. I'm not asking you what um, you think. I'm asking you what do you want. I want to feel like I'm not being followed. I want to feel like I'm not going to end up with whatever it is that's got him sick. So you want Eddie to go away? She looks ashamed and can't quite form the words, but you know that's what she wants. Johnny kind of gives her a hard look, but nods reassuringly at her, drags down the rest of the, uh, of the Marlboro all the way down to the filter, throws it at the ground, and then heads back through the bar. She leans against the wall, and as you're kind of going, you can see she just sparks up another and seems determined to chain smoke as long as she can with this impromptu break that she's taking. He actually puts a hand out and catches himself on the door frame. When are you getting off tonight? Uh, 2.30. He looks at his watch and kind of figures out when about, how much time he's got for all kinds of things. Continues on. So, 
Johnny's got two things he's got to get done tonight. Yep. Um, he fig basically he figures if this thing is following her, whatever happened to him, and there's a whole host of things it could be that are running through his head. His best bet is to probably tail her, see if he can spot anybody else doing the same. But he's also got to get this girl where she needs to go, and he has an idea about what he wants to do with her. Kabir has talked to Johnny about lupines. Yes? Yes. They are out in the woods not too far from here. Right. What did we say? That it was um what was the farm you guys went to? That was in Wallingford. that was in Wallingford? Yeah. And it's that's probably the closest area where I'm I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's kind of around Wallingford. Up to like around Meriden, Middletown, almost over by like, like Sleeping Giants over by there, right? Yeah, and that's Sleeping probably Giant Castle Craig. A lot of those places are the places that Kabir talked about. You know, stories about you know lupines being very aggressive and destroying stupid kindred that infringe upon their homes. Sleeping Giant is out going basically going through Anarch territory to get there, right? Mm-hmm. I think Johnny will probably give that a shot. Okay. He figures that the last thing I need is to be running into any elements of the Sabbat while I'm doing this. They might be less likely to crusade through an uh, Anarch area while they're currently going after Camarian territory. At least that's my thought. Does that make sense at all? Yeah. Don't absolutely. want to stir up two nests when you're, when you're really just going for one. Right. The Sabbat's, the MO speci specifically of the pack, the killing spree, is that their target isn't actually the Camarilla Kindred. Yeah. Their intent is actually to risk the masquerade as frequently and as hard as possible so that it becomes a resource drain for the Camarilla, which means that when the actual crusade happens, the Camarilla is so and, on the back foot that it's pretty I, much already done. And I figure that there might be a chance that, that they're actually staying in our territory, but if they're sleeping there, their abbot is probably not trying to cause any trouble because they don't want their home base of operation. So right. like as a general rule, nomadic packs don't, so packs don't shit where they eat. In this case, that might be the safest route is to find a spot where, the, where they are staying to travel through it. Right. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I think I'm going to go through Anarch territory to get over to Sleeping Giant because I want to try and return this body to her kinfolk. Okay. Uh, so you're going to take a route uh, or her through... kin, not actually kinfolk. I don't think Johnny understands what kinfolk are. In, in the... No, it's pretty much <laughs> yeah, 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 lupines. Yeah. What I want you to do is I want you to make an intelligence plus streetwise rule mm. as you navigate Anarch territory intent on not going. Well, actually, creatures. a better question. Am I going to have time to do that before she gets off at 2.30? Yes. Okay, perfect. Look at that. A uh, single success. Perfect. You make your way to Sleeping Giant. And you kind of arrive to a pretty simple parking lot. Uh, there's a lot of hiking trails that are arranged. Everything's kind of closed up for the night. So you end up kind of having to like actually kind of park right in front of the parking lot. You know, again, there's uh, a set of hiking trails that are kind of marked with different colors. It's the white one that seems to kind of lead uh, deepest into the, the wooded area and is the, mo the least traversed by the kind. He gets out of his uh, Xterra, looks down at his pocket where the cigarettes are, and puts them back in the uh, truck. He doesn't want to take chance that he lights up in there because he's heard tales that these things can smell out anything. So he knows he probably already reeks of cigarettes, but he doesn't need to be smoke sparking up a new one and drawing attention. And he will then open up the back and gingerly pick up the, uh, the tarp with the girl. Bef uh, be actually, before he picks her up, I think he actually pulls it back a little bit and just takes a look at her to make sure that she's presentable. And that's when you see that he's actually taken the time to, like, buy some clothes, wash her from some of the blood, and just try to, like, be as respectful as he can to the, uh, the corpse of this poor young girl. Gives her kind of one last look to make she's sure that things are in order, and then wraps her back up, picks her up, and starts walking up the trail. The moment you feel like the crunch of cold earth beneath your boots, you start to feel as though you're not alone. And it is this foreboding presence that always feels... It's the feeling like, 
like there's someone right behind you with a hand outreached and just barely not touching like the back of your neck, your ears, your hair, that, that like kind of static energy that you feel when you know someone is right behind you. You feel it every step you take along the way. Once again, he uses his ample blood supply tonight to heighten all of his physical senses. So he makes himself stronger, faster, more ready to take a punch because he starts to get the kind of feeling like, I'm not going to make it out of this without some kind of fight. You can feel the echoes of your beast rise. It rattles in its cage and tries to force you to turn back. I need a Rotrek check. Ooh. The difficulty of this check is five. Mm. And that's courage? It is. Three successes. Okay. With steely nerves, uh, you clench that like jawline of yours and you push on through. You kind of start to wind up the side of this cliff. For you, it's it's actually a pretty easy walk, but up towards the top, you reach this point where there's the open sky overhead. It's a clearing. There's the ruins of old structures that had been built here a long time ago. You start to feel like maybe... This is a place where maybe I could put her to rest. Right. And where her kind will likely find her. Right. Finds a, a good, clear spot, open sight to the sky... Gently lays her down, reaches into his jacket, and pulls out a small little note written on the inside. It just says, I'm sorry. Folds that up, puts it in with her, and kind of slowly backs away, keeping his eyes on the tree line, and starts to take steps towards the trail. When you take a step towards the trail, you actually catch the glimpse of a flashlight that shines towards you. Looking at you from the trail itself is a uh, older woman. She's probably actually maybe a little older than you. She looks startled to see you there. There's a couple things that you notice about her right away. Her eyes are this kind of uncomfortably light, light, light blue that kind of um, takes on this like sheen. And you kind of recognize that her a lot of her features, her bone structure... Her now graying blonde hair kind of resembles the the young woman that you brought here. She nervously looks at you, kind of like as wary of you as you are of her. She kind of leans on her back leg, and you catch a glimpse that along her, her, her right side, which is the side kind of facing away from you, you can kind of see a rifle, like a, like a hunting rifle. Around her neck is this, on a thong, this, like, little iron medallion that kind of resembles a small uh, handled hammer designed from Nordic knotwork. Her wariness gives way to anger when she kind of, like, looks and sees what you've done. <sighs> Johnny outstretches his hands and just very calmly and collected. This is a peace offering. What, what do you? What do you? What do you? What do you mean a peace offering? Her eyes immediately start to water. My kind stole this girl and are responsible for her death, but I wanted to make sure she was returned to your people. What is your kind? Those who drink blood. Leech. He kind of bows his head, kind of in shame. When my husband hears about this, his, his rage, the things he will do. You're right to be angry. I know that. I kind of like, is this look like, like though you're much bigger than her, she is ready to fight. My name's Johnny. If your husband needs revenge, I won't deny him that. And he slowly starts kind of backing off. She kind of steps to the side, seemingly willing to fight, but not actually convinced she could win. And as you move towards the trail, she kind of passes you and kind of just as careful of what you might do, uh, 
she makes her way to her daughter. Bloody tears kind of start welling up in Johnny's eyes. It wasn't the court of New Haven that stole her. All of your kind is a plague. You're not wrong. And we are its cure. He looks at her really sadly. I wish that were true. He kind of puts his hands up. She kind of gives you this look like she does too. And he turns around and he starts just walking down the trail slowly. He's basically kind of fine with if she needs to take a parting shot, it's probably not the worst thing. On some level, you can you can kind of sense that the reasonable side of her has pieced together this gesture that you've made. But all sense of logic is lost in, in her need to grieve for her daughter and her focus becomes on that. And you do not find yourself attacked by her at all as you back away onto the trail. Once he gets back down to the truck, he kind of like wipes away some of the, the blood you know, that, that's now staining his cheeks, wrenches open the car door, pulls out the pack of cigarettes, immediately pull, sticks one in his mouth and lights it up. The moment you kind of like light that cig- cigarette as though it's kind of this serendipitous moment. Nearby where you are, there's, there's actually kind of like a, a number of like homes. Back from the top of Sleeping Giant, you hear this this howl that echoes and booms and you can kind of like feel the Xterra shake like the trees kind of like shake lights in homes start flickering on this whole area becomes frightened by whatever anthem has been howled from on top of that mountain Johnny keeps his tries to keep his cool one hand on his beast, and the other one on the steering wheel of the Xterra, puts it into drive, and starts heading out, almost certain that that's probably not going to be the last time he hears that howl. You make your way back, not sure whether or not you're being watched, that feeling, it takes a while for it to leave, but eventually, you arrive to the Sherwood Cafe. Before, uh, before 2.30? Yep. Perfect. Before 2.30. And Phil is uh, standing outside. He's smoking a cigarette. He kind of gives you a wave when he spots the Xterra and makes his way over to you to speak with you when the when the SUV pulls up. Hey. How's it going? Good, good. Uh, how did the, the talk go? I learned some interesting things. But I was right, though, right? Something's wrong? I think you're right. Okay. Look... You and I, we have an arrangement. You help out when we need you. And I promise you, this is not one of those situations where we're crying wolf. We Phil, you never cry wolf. Thank you. And I appreciate what you do to look out for my home. I'm glad we have an understanding. I understand Sheila was a little rude to you, and I'll talk to her about that. No, no, no. I, uh, I like to make mountains out of molehills. <laughs> It also helps her understand that I'm not, uh, I'm not the usual kind of clientele that she can just kind of bat around with her eyes. Yeah, well, she'll do that. She thinks she can get away with it. Lord knows. Yeah, I know a couple like her. Well, uh, I got something for you. Oh? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a small gesture, and he actually heads over to his car, which is actually parked not too far from yours, and out of the passenger seat, he retrieves a carton of Marlboro cigarettes that is shy one pack. And uh, <laughs> it's like, for your trouble. Oh, Phil. If I could blush, I might be doing it right now. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to get back to work, but thank you. You got it, old friend. He heads on inside, and a lot of the the young troublemakers that were present earlier have kind of left. Things have significantly wind down and more returned to normal. So Johnny is going to move the Xterra into a position where he can kind of keep eyes on the parking lot Mm -hmm. off of the Sherwood so he can watch when Sheila leaves, gets into her car, and he's just going to shadow her and see if he can spot anybody else doing the same. Okay. So you sit by and you watch, and uh, shortly after 2.30, it looks like they've kind of busted everything down and are ready to go for the night. And Sheila makes her way out of uh, the back, waves goodbye, and she actually kind of tucks her hands into this big, puffy, navy blue coat that she has. And she starts kind of walking. 
Johnny, kind of shocked that she's just walking back, uh, grabs up a few items in, in the Xterra, pack of smokes, make sure his jacket's on, and then slowly and quietly gets out, shuts the door, locks it, and he'll actually start tailing her on foot. Okay. I'll give me Dex with stealth. Hey, I got one success. Okay. Uh, she does not seem to notice uh, you following along. It's about 20 minutes into the walk that you start to notice that someone else is following her. This person, while they walk, they kind of like shiver. They're not wearing a coat or anything. They're just kind of wearing like a big white t-shirt and baggy jeans. This uncomfortable, twitchy, shivering person just kind of starts heading towards her. She does not seem aware, though she is wary. She keeps looking around and, and is definitely concerned that there's some sort of trouble. But does not seem to have spotted him yet. And he goes as far as, like, ducking behind cars. He's not even just stalking her like a typical stalker. He's stalking her like an animal stalks someone. So two things. Johnny is not sure. I think Johnny's actually been to New York a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Just in, in his line of work. Does not like going there. No, um, New York's pretty bad. He know he's probably heard some rumors about some of the things, but I don't know if he's actually heard about anything going on down in the sewers necessarily. There are urban legends that exist. Actually, better yet, how about, how about I give you an occult check and you can tell me what he may have heard? Yeah, about that. Ahead. Is that all right? Yeah. One success. Okay. Uh, so with one success. You know about two things that go into the sewers and are aware that there are more. Uh, one of them is that there is a legend of a massive, massive white alligator that resides in the New York sewers. It is known to have consumed and gobbled up numerous uh, workers that have gone down there in the past, as well as uh, the homeless. It's actually kind of particularly among the homeless that this urban legend exists. But that doesn't line up because no. he, he got bit by something now, and managed thing, to get away. The other thing is a little stranger. That talks about strange, spongy, fleshy monsters that exist deep underneath New York City. And the rumor has it that the Nosferatu have been fighting with these things for a few years now, trying to maintain their subterranean control of New York. Now, when I, when I think back on that, and I look at the way that this guy is quivering, am I at all reminded of the Xantosa house? Not physically, but you do get a bad feeling. Like, in some way, on some level, these things are connected. He's going to start to pick up the pace a little bit and try and get a little bit closer and before this thing even gets close enough to Sheila to pounce, Johnny wants to pounce on him and pull him right into an alcove out of line of sight. Okay, uh, give me a, another dex plus stealth. Do I have any willpower at this point? It's been a couple of nights. Uh, you'll have refreshed four willpower. Okay. That would also count for like the, the girl that I returned, because I feel like that would be a, mm -hmm. that'd be a, re a refresher of willpower for Johnny, his uh, nature's caregiver. So. Oh, yeah, definitely. All right, Dex plus Stealth? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll spend willpower on this. Okay. And actually, um, I'll spend three more blood just to pump up Dex uh, strength and, and constitution. Or stamina, I'm sorry. Four successes. Okay, uh, so you're going to be able to use those as dice for an ambush. Perfect. And you are successfully poised to ambush this opponent. Okay, yeah, so you're going to roll uh, dex plus brawl plus four dice from the stealth and then two dice from striking from behind. Would sucker basically, they're hitting him with a tackle from behind into this, into a thing. Would that be considered street fighting? Yes. Okay, cool. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll get the... Only two successes. Okay. I rolled a bunch of ones. Is <laughs> so, uh, grapple? Uh, yeah, I figure, actually. Okay. And I will spend an extra blood for celerity for an extra action. Uh, so you're going to use that in actual rounds. Okay. Uh, so for now, did you roll the die for celerity on your attack roll? No, I didn't. Uh, actually, I didn't. since I get to do more, I'll, I'll roll two more. So that's one more success. Two more successes. Okay. Uh, so with four successes, you grab him and pull him into an alley. The alley itself is covered in grime. It's again, it's so cold. So there's there's little puddles that are completely kind of frozen over. And in this case, the wet, slick ground from whatever slime it is that that people dump out this way is frozen. So this is all kind of very slippery. You grab him and you no 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 no. Um, and I will just smash him into the wall to try and knock the breath out of him. Okay. Uh, give me an initiative roll. 
15. Okay, uh, so you're going to go first. Okay. So what are you doing? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to slam, now that I have him in a grapple, I'm going to slam him against the brick wall to mm-hmm. knock the breath out of him. And that, I figure, will do one of two things. It'll either stun him a little bit, or it'll tell me that this guy does not have breath to knock out of him. Okay, give me a uh, dex plus brawl. Three successes. Okay, give me a strength roll uh, with potence and two successes from attack. Can I just add blood to uh, to auto potence? Mm-hmm. I will. Uh, seven levels of uh, bashing damage. Cool. He soaks three. He definitely seems to uh, have a, an active like respiratory system, and he definitely breathes, and you kind of knock the wind out of him. But his eyes don't move together. Mm. And when his face contorts into like uh, an aggressive reaction, it doesn't contort in a humane way. With like an overly long tongue and sharp teeth, Eddie glares at you. And he's like, no, no, no. And will rake at you with these bone spurs that exude pat through the tips of his fingers, turning into like strange claws. And will you have to break the grapple first? Uh, that is his plan. Okay. So first, let's try to break the grapple. And that's an opposed strength check. Strengthless brawl. Ooh, plus brawl too. You say nine successes. Okay. Yeah, two. So uh, you will maintain control. Did you have any extra actions this round? Yeah, I did. It's all on you. Seeing that his tongue is distended, sharp, and whatever the hell this thing is, I'm going to put it down, and I'll ask the domain about it later. Okay. Seeing that he has a functioning respiratory system, I feel confident that I can probably just smash its head into the brick wall and get it to stop moving. So he's going to rear back with him and once again smash him even harder into the wall, really leaning in with the potence to just splatter whatever's left of his brain. Give me a roll. Five successes. Four roll over into damage. I will spend... I will not spend. I'll just use my potence this... Ah, that's a tough... No, I will spend for potence. I just gotta... I gotta drink now. <laughs> Started off with some blood and I've used most of it. Bra life. I know, right? <laughs> Run hot, baby. All right, so... So three levels plus the four, so seven more bashing damage. Uh, he falls unconscious and kind of goes limp. But even while he's unconscious, the body twitches... And like roils as though something's underneath his skin. He drops the body unconscious and then immediately puts a boot to just finish him off. Okay. Do not ask questions. You execute him and uh, put your boot through his skull. The skull seems soft. It's more like a cardboard and a grape than it is like anything that's like a solid bone. When it breaks and the tissue tears, you can see this orangey, pussy moss. That kind of spills out of his skull. And this muck kind of like sticks and kind of stretches like mozzarella cheese when you like lift your boot off of where you made the kill. And you scrape it on like the icy, cold, like grimy ground. And it's just like everywhere. And it seeps and slurps. And it is just a terrible experience. Ugh. He kind of just recoils in disgust at this thing. The body kind of twitches. At first, it's clearly death spasms, and you're used to that sort of thing. He backs Uh, off a few steps and pulls out the lighter that he took from Phil, strikes it, and kind of holds it down towards the body. The body wiggles and, like, writhes as though whatever it is that's uh, controlling this host is reacting to the presence of fire, irritated by it. But it's all silent because his head is gone. So it's just this headless corpse writhing and wriggling and almost panicking when confronted by fire. Johnny just takes a look around. This body's got to go. And he's trying to think of ways to to help it along. You know, you actually recognize the smell. Where do I recognize it from? It smells like the weeping bear and the mongrel monster that had to be put down before it. (sighs) He's going to um, look back. The Xterra is quite a ways away from here, isn't it? It's, it's about a t- it was about a 20-minute walk before you got to this point. He'll walk over. Are there any cars parked on the road? Yes. He'll go kind of like looking in the windows of a few cars to mm-hmm. see if he can like spot anything to help him out. What are you looking for to help you out? I think ideally he's looking for something to start a small fire at least. 
I, I mean, in a pinch, he could like smash open like a uh, the gas tank on a car and and get gas. But that's such a fucking mess. He's now he's looking at full on masquerade breach. If if somebody catches him lighting a car on fire and stuff, like it could get bad. Do you have but uh, investigation? Maybe some like if I can see some like newspaper. Like, just as, like, some kindling, so I can start a small fire right on this kind of, like, door stoop where his body is, right? He does have a point of investigation. All right, give me a perception plus investigation. Success. With one success, you are able to find the back of a station wagon. The old ones have, like, the, 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 the wood-looking siding to them. Yeah. And the back... There is uh, a stack of, like, a big fucking stacks of newspapers uh, that have not yet been delivered and a blanket. Beautiful. It's like one of those old kind of fuzzy blankets. Johnny's going to take a look around, make sure that no one's watching. At least no one is obviously, like, watching or, like, getting interested in coming over. Give a sharp elbow to the uh, to the window on the... Uh... It breaks open. There's and no car alarm in this. He'll reach in and kind of unlatch the uh, the trunk, push up that door, and he'll gather some of the uh, some of that newspaper and kind of just crush it up into little balls. And he'll just start throwing the balls of crushed up paper into the little alcove where this body is just wriggling. When you return to the little alcove, you find that the body is like ten feet further down the alley. I'll throw the blanket on top of him. Mm kind of like roll them up in that hoist it and maybe there's like an empty dumpster somewhere there's trash cans like you know the old like trash barrels that our like homeless would use to with a little bit a little bit of johnny saxon uh uh elbow grease he's gonna take this blanket full of goo and just stuff it into a metal garbage can easily accomplished he'll uh then take some of those uh some of the the newspaper kind of just stuff it in there just get some a bunch of dry stuff to help it kind of go up and he'll uh, start a fire. Though it is headless, you can hear a squealing. That's it's kind of like when a lobster gets dropped into boiling water. Soon after, whatever it is falls limp and simply burns. Johnny will go back, walk down a few blocks, grab the Xterra, drive back this way, park outside the alley, and by this time go back to check to see what what the state of this is. You make arrangements. By the time you get back. Body's done. The remains in the garbage can, how uh, how human do those look? At this point, it looks like just kind of like burning meat. It's kind of hard to tell exactly what's going on. I mean, if like a police officer or someone who knows what they're doing is to take a look, this would probably be identified as a human body. Uh, but right now, it just kind of smells like burning flesh and is just a little hunk of meat burning inside of that can. Yeah, that's uh, good, good enough for government work. And it, it burns well kind of satisfied with the fact that this is done and gone he'll leave that as it is a burned up body in new haven is a pretty terrible thing to have to find but not necessarily gonna immediately draw back to the court it'll be on the news for a day yeah gives kind of a heavy sigh make double checks himself over um, none of the the mozzarella flesh has stuck to you uh you're probably okay and with that he'll pack it up and probably head back to his haven okay make it back to the haven smelling like cigarettes and burning flesh by and large the night's down at the bar it's quiet and it's just you and a little record player and a little bit of silence and here's beast kind of hungrily growling at his at his insides but he just ends up popping open a new pack of cigarettes from the carton phil got him pulls out another one and goes over to his records picks something a little bit Easier going, puts it on the player and then just lays in the cot and waits for the sun to come up and sleep to take over. Johnny listens to music that kind of soothes his beast and eventually he finds himself falling into a restless sleep. Path of Night is an actual play Vampire the Masquerade podcast set in the classic world of darkness. Britta, the unknown new embrace, was played by Rebecca Steigelfest. Johnny Saxon, the Bruja, was played by Garrett Gabby. Miles Davenport, the Venture, was played by Tim Davis. Neil Foster, the Malkavian, was played by Rob Muirhead. Wind Cabot, the Gangrel, was played by Erica Webb. Your Storyteller was Lex Lopez, recording by Rebecca Steigelfest. This episode edited by Rob Muirhead. 
The music used in this episode was January Grunge Love Fest by Technoax. Visit them online at technoax.com. T-E-K-N-O-X.com. Path of Night uses the 20th Anniversary Edition rule set of Vampire the Masquerade with a few limited house rules. Vampire the Masquerade and the Storyteller System are owned by Paradox Interactive. Make sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at at Path of Night Pod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Path of Night Podcast, or email us at Path of Night Podcast at gmail.com. See you next time, Kindred.